Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. Well, you remember our Epson HX20 from the last episode. We started out with a barely visible LCD display. We cleaned it up, recapped it, and got our LCD display back because we fixed the seven volt rail that drives the LCD. This time, we're gonna take a look at the cassette unit, which yes, I've pre-taken apart, but there's a reason for that. And remember we had a really sickly old ribbon. So I have procured a new old stock ribbon from eBay and we have some printer paper. So we'll refurbish the cassette unit. We'll pop some paper and a ribbon in the printer so we can try out the ribbon too. And if we have enough time, we'll try to connect this to the computer so we can use the computer as a substitute for the disc and video interface unit that was available for this thing back in the day. Well, let's jump right in. Here are just a few of the circuit boards I've had made recently by PCBWay, who is nice enough to sponsor this video. So whether you need a few boards or a lot of boards, check out PCBWay. Jump on over to the PCBWay website and get your instant quote on standard circuit boards, advanced, flex, they even do assembly, and you can get stencils made. For your next project, check out PCB Way. You might remember we can just release this micro cassette drive from the main computer and slide it right out. It plugs right in. And if we flip it over, there are two screws here that hold this back cover on. Now, I have not put these all the way back in. I needed to go ahead and take this guy apart so I could measure the belt to get a new belt on the way. And no, it does not come with blue painters tape in here. I put that on there to protect some wiring, which I had to desolder, but I'll show you all about that. No worries. And here we have our circuit board for this cassette unit. And you notice that these are all surface mount parts. Now, from today's perspective, these look like large surface mount parts, but back in the day, this was quite an advanced circuit board, and this had to be quite expensive to build. To separate the cassette mechanism from the case, there are four screws. One, two, three, and four, which is kind of hiding here under these loose wires. However, we don't want to bother these other two screws for now. The three smaller screws are all the same size, and that fourth screw on the top under the wires, we'll get to that later. Raise the cassette door and then wiggle the mechanism, and with a little patience, you can get the whole thing to slide right out. To remove the board from the mechanism, we need to pull out the two screws shown here. The third larger case screw is loose at this point. And these two screws are the same size, and that third one is kind of an oddball. It's different than everything else. So you can see it is much longer. Okay, and this is where you run into the problem that you can't get the board off of here. And not only are these wires stopping you from doing that, but there is a sensor that's soldered on right here. Right here. There is a sensor that is mounted to the cassette mechanism that is soldered on right there. So you need to use your solder sucker or your uh, solder braid and clean that loose. Then that'll get you to the point where this thing wiggles. Oops, I forgot all these two screws. There are washers. And they feel like stainless steel, so I'm gonna have to use some pliers to get them off of there. This guy had no washer. Okay, anyhow, we're back to the point where we've got this loose. We've got our board all dang and loose, but we can't really move it too far because we've got wires connected to it on both sides. So what I found, the best way to do to disconnect the least number of wires from the least important things are to disconnect this red and black wire from here and these two orange wires from here. Well, these two orange wires go to this tachometer here 
which is just a feedback of the motor speed. They are non-polarized. This is an AC signal. I went ahead and marked one of them with a black marker. Even though I know it doesn't matter, I still feel compelled to mark everything as I take it apart. And the red and black is, of course, polarized because you want your cassette motor to spin in the right direction. Anytime you take something like this apart, take pictures, make notes. That way you can get it back together right. Once you get those wires off of there, you can carefully fold this guy open like this. And you've still got six wires hooked up here. Let's go to the cassette head and that sort of jazz. And there's two other wires right here, which is probably the, this is the motor that moves the head in and out, that type of thing. And here you have where your belt goes. And of course, there's no belt on there because the original belt was like this. Well, it was in one piece, but it would have broken as soon as it was tried to be used. At least it didn't turn to goo. And since I didn't care about it, I was able to just cut it so I could lay it out flat and make a accurate length measurement. Even after doing that, it was kind of right in between two standard sizes, which I have here. An SBR 6.4 and SBO 6.3. These have a slightly different cross section. And one is 6.3 inches and one is 6.4 inches because measuring thing in inches is way better than that metric rubbish. Um, so we will try both and see which works better. I ordered these from my favorite place to order belts, which is a place called Turntable Needles in Corvallis, Oregon. And surprisingly enough, USPS got this all the way from Oregon to Missouri in three days. It's amazing that they can ship something from 200 miles away and it'll take 10 days, but halfway across the country and it's right here. So we will have to put a new belt on here and it kind of wraps around this way above this little idler under this tachometer and back. So we really just need to remove the tachometer and these two screws. And another little surprise when I took this apart, three electrolytic capacitors. And yes, they are all leaking. And only one of them was the same size as the capacitors on the main board. So I had to order some new caps too, but luckily those also came in. So we can do all of this in one shot. I think we'll start with Mr. Belt here. See which one of these belts works the best. Okay, so I just dropped this spacer. This I just threw the spacer on the cassette mechanism. This little spacer here, you notice it's got a little step down section. I just can't seem to hold on to it. Butterfingers. Anyhow, that guy goes in there like that with that step down section down, so it kind of pops right into this bracket. That's what that big long screw goes through. And we will take our little screwdriver here. Out. And I believe that the screws for the tachometer here are unique to the tachometer. So we will keep those separated from everything else. And yes, there are more spacers under here. However, these spacers are brass. And we are going to pick these guys up, set them out the way. And luckily, since our old belt did not turn to goo, we don't have anything to clean up. And here is the spacers that was under the circuit board. When we go to reassemble it, those two spacers I just took off set here. And they look like this. There you go. They look like that. And the step section goes up into the circuit board. It fits in a hole in the circuit board. And when I am moving this thing, I see here I'm grabbing both parts at once. I don't want to drag one side or the other around by these wires and potentially break them off there. And we've got these two little screws here. And we'll take those out of there. And these, of course, are completely different screws. I believe they are similar to each other. 
Yes, these are the same screws. And they look like that. Just a little Phillips screw. And when I took this apart, I did not notice which orientation this plastic roller was in, and it comes off, so we're going to have to divine that. It has a little bump on one end of it, which I suspect goes down. And this little plate we took off of there just puts pressure on top of that roller. There's a little pin here it goes on. So I'm thinking that bump has to go down because there's a little bit of a ridge right here. And if the flat part of this roller went down, it would smack on that ridge. First, I decided to compare the profiles of the two new replacement belts with the original. The second one, the shorter belt, was a little closer match to the original. Yeah, these two are very similar. So I'm going to change my mind here. Tinkerer's prerogative. We're going to go with the shorter belt to start with. I like how the profile matches. I measured the cross section of the belt with calipers, but that's kind of tricky with something that's squishy and not to mention an old piece of rubber because you don't know how much it has shrunk over time, how much you're squeezing it with the calipers and altering it when you're trying to measure it. Uh, if anything, it feels a little loose. Yeah, that's still awfully floppy. I don't think this belt is going to work. And as if by magic, a week goes by, a new belt shows up that's a little shorter, and we'll go ahead and pop that guy on there. This is a 6 inch long belt. And the tension is much better, and the profile is even good. So I think we've got a winner here. I'll put the part number to this in the description down below. Of course, reassembly is the opposite of disassembly. So here we go, sped up 400% with some funky background music. The next thing we need to do is take care of our three leaky capacitors here, C1, C2, and C3. And if we kind of flip these over as a set here, we will scratch all the crusty stuff we can off of the solder pads with our fiberglass scratching tool. Then we'll clean up that mess using an alcohol-soaked Q-tip. We'll add some flux, and then we'll try to reflow each joint. We'll clean up the mess we just made with some more alcohol, so we can get a look at what we're doing. And we may need to repeat this process a few times to get rid of all of that crusty stuff on the solder pads. And finally, we can go ahead and walk the capacitors out. I'm going to heat the top leg here and push the capacitor down and heat the bottom leg and pull it up. And that'll work the legs right out of the pads. With the capacitors out of there, we can use our solder sucking tool and get all the solder out of the holes. Then we'll give things a good scrub to clean up the mess that we made. On the top side of the board, we'll start out by cleaning all our pads and then we'll give them a scratch with the fiberglass tool to remove any corrosion on the top. After cleaning the pads with alcohol again, we'll apply some flux to the pads and we'll tin them, just like we did on the bottom side. And we may need to repeat this a few times too to get these pads all the way cleaned up. Then we want to go ahead and give the top side of the board a good clean as well. Okay, I've got all our caps popped in there. And I'll just splay a leg on each one of them out a little bit to keep it from falling. Put a little flux on our joints. Touch one leg. 
push it up against the board from the other side. Same thing on the next one in line. And just to check it yet, they all look okay from the top. Now we can get the second leg on each one. Reflow the first leg on each one because I didn't keep the heat on there quite as long. Only small pads and there's not a lot of ground fill on the other side. Um, about three seconds per joint seemed to work okay. Got a scrub. I really like a soft bristled toothbrush the best most of the time because it gets in all the nooks and crannies. Put a rag on here and brush over top of that to suck up the mess. Got that tip from Noel's Retro Lab. Check out his channel if you haven't seen it. Don't forget, there are two spacers that go under the circuit board and the one that goes down on the motor bracket as well. Now we can go ahead and carefully fold the circuit board back over the mechanism, making sure we line the spacers up into the holes in the circuit board. Then we need to put our washers in place on these two holes, and then we'll go ahead and install the screws. I did add the locations and color codes of all the wires that are soldered to the board on the capacitor map. Now we just need to fish our wires through the holes, which is easier said than done, and solder them in place. Reassembly is just the opposite of taking it apart. With the cassette door flipped up, we sneak it through the top cover and kind of wiggle everything into place. This can take some patience, and you just want to make sure that the cassette door does come all the way through. This spacer popped out of place when I was putting the cassette mechanism back in, so I'll just slip it back in there and then put the screw through into the case. Now we'll snug up all four screws that hold the mechanism into the top case. This lever is what releases the cassette door. It's held in place by one of the tiny screws from below. You need to make sure that this lever is lined up before you finally tighten the screw from the bottom. Now we'll slip the bottom cover on by inserting the two latches on the connector side first and then putting the two screws in the back. And finally, we'll make sure that our cassette door works before we say that we're done. Notice that this brass area here makes contact with a little protrusion on the bottom of the cassette case. Is this some sort of sense line so you know when the cassette is inserted into the machine? Well, what do you say we have a look at this expansion unit? Of course, it plugs onto the main computer like this. And if we flip it over here, we see two screw holes. And we just have two little screws in there like that. And then this top just peels right off. This is what we see on the inside. There is one screw holding the board in place. And then we can tilt this guy out of here, like so, with a little patience. There we go. Just like that. What do you say we have a closer look at this and see what all these parts do? Here's our expansion board. We have 16K of static RAM for a total of 32K of battery backed static RAM on the computer. Next we have all of our glue logic. This takes care of things such as address decoding and chip selection. Next we have sockets for two expansion ROMs. These could have been used for anything from office applications to the control programs for scientific apparatus. Next we have various dip switches and jumpers which enable the option ROMs and select which address they appear at in memory. It seems to be a well thought out and well built expansion board. Now let's take a look at how to reinstall the expansion unit on the computer. To install the expansion unit back on the main computer, we of course need a main computer. We need the two brackets that look like this, the screws, and the expansion unit. If we just rotate this guy sideways like this, we can kind of 
slip the brackets underneath it like so. Then with the brackets slipped into place, we can take our screws in a screwdriver. Just get these started like so. Just like that. And we'll have a look at these from the back to make sure everything looks aligned properly. Yeah, that looks like it should. So I will go ahead and tighten that guy down. This guy down. I'll slip our expansion unit right up there. And plug it in. And then we have four screws that go in here. There we go, all back in one piece. Now that we've got the main unit back together, let's go ahead and get our paper and new ribbon put in the printer. Kick the computer on, and I'm going to switch the printer switch to on. There's a little raised portion here that says push, and if we push down on that, it'll tilt this cover up. And then we can rotate this section back. This is where the printer paper lives. There's also a little ribbon in here that'll help you pull the printer paper out. And this particular paper is from a Sharp CE150 printer. So we're gonna push the paper up to the feed roller right here, press the paper feed button. Okay, there we go. Now it's feeding the paper through. It's just slow as molasses in January. That's why it does mention in the manual that as long as the printer's not running, you can do this. Now I see why they suggested you do that. Now we'll take our new ribbon. Okay, and we're just going to thread the paper up through the ribbon like that. And push him right down on there. Nope. Looks like our ribbon is kind of poking up right there. To get the ribbon out, so we can try that again, you push on this side and it pops it up. Yeah. We will try this again. I'm gonna tighten the ribbon up a little bit. There we go. Yeah, now I can close that back cover, hook our printer paper through here, set that into place. Now we're all ready for some computing. Now that we've got the HX20 all back together and working, I've had a chance to play with it. And one thing I found out is that after you've had them memory expansion unit on and off. Um, it's a good idea to do the control at to initialize it. Uh, otherwise you get some silly things happening when you're trying to use the different basic program areas. And as you can see we have a new selection here on the screen called Hey, which is a basic program. So if I press 3 it'll automatically run that. There we go. This is just a simple two-line basic program that we've all written. And if I press the menu button here, the basic program area is broken up into five individual blocks. So you can save five individual basic programs on the system at one time. Right now, I just have one in slot three. Let's say I want to load another program off of tape into a different slot. So we can go into basic by pressing 2. And it's automatically going to go into the program area 1, which I have that hey program in. We can log in to area 2 like that. 
Now we're in program area two, which is occupying zero bytes. Now the first thing I'll do is tell it to rewind the tape. And now that we know the tape is rewound, I am going to tell it to load from cassette zero, which is the built-in micro cassette drive. Cassette one would be an external cassette. PR test, which is a program I wrote earlier and saved. And you might just be able to see the cassette is moving. And it found that program and now it's loading it in. All right, so if we list our program, so we've got a bunch of L print lines in there, which output to the printer. And if we want to title this so it's available from the main menu, we type in title, PR, and a name, just like that. Now, when the program is titled, it protects it so you can't use the new command and accidentally delete it. But if you do want to delete this program slot, you can just title like this. And it'll unprotect it, it'll remove it from the menu, and you can go ahead and new to erase it. I'm not going to do that right now. I want to go back to the menu and show you that our printer test program is in there. The printer is on. You can't quite see that here. It's just to the edge of the screen. It's this button. It's on. And I'm going to select program 4, and it will load it and run it. And we are getting a printout. And holding down the line feed button is really slow. You can also pull the paper out manually as long as it's not currently printing. We can rip it off of there. This paper is really thin. It is like, oh, cash register paper. But you can see it does a fairly decent job printing. And I printed out some of the graphic symbols that are included as well. So we're able to load and save and print so we've got everything working. You might notice I've added a strip of paper here with some labels. Let me explain that. If you press Control and PF1, it'll take you into a manual cassette operation mode. And it tells us now our cassette counter is at 71. So we can press PF4 to rewind it. And it takes it back to the start. We can fast forward stop we can slow forward stop and rewind so this is useful if you want to manually you know find your way through the tape to find a particular program and you can even pull up this cassette count from basic which is kind of interesting and when you're done with this manual cassette manipulation mode you just press pf5 and you go back to where you were. You can see I've made some notes here after scanning through the basic programming manual. I found a couple DIN connectors which match the serial port. Uh, this would be for a regular RS-232 COM port for controlling printers and things like that. And this one is for the high-speed serial which is used for the external disk and video display. So I think since we've spent so much time just getting this unit refurbished, uh, I'll make a separate episode out of creating the serial cables and using the program to simulate the disk drive and video display on a PC. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this second look at the Epson HX20. We've got this unit all fixed up now. We refurbished the micro cassette drive, We've got the printer working again, and we're able to test some saving and loading and printing, and everything is going along swimmingly. 
So in a future episode for this guy, we'll take a look at making some serial port cables so we can connect to the virtual uh, floppy drive and display unit and see how that works. And we'll try to try out some other programs that I found online that were written for this. I'd like to take a moment to say thanks to the folks who help support the Haybert channel through Patreon and other means. Your support is greatly appreciated and you keep this channel going. If you'd like to find out some more information about becoming a supporting member, well, just look in the description down below for some links. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. Just leave them in the comments section down below. And until next time, bye.